My name is Dave Hollenbach, the host of From Embers to Excellence, a podcast that explores the many facets of leadership from the perspectives of some amazing people. We discuss the triumphs and failures that have shaped our lives and our leadership philosophies. I've found that it isn't whether we fail that defines us, but when we do fail, how we respond. Leaders dust off the ashes and use their failures as fuel to work harder and as lessons to come back wiser and stronger, more resilient, more determined, and more committed to excellence. Today I'm speaking with Jeremy Sherman. He is a PhD, a cradle to grave science researcher and writer. He has been studying the unbroken chain from the origins of life, from chemistry to humankind's grave situation today. He's the author of the Columbia University Press book, Neither Ghost Nor Machine, The Emergence and Nature of Cells, but also has written uh, over a thousand articles with nine million readers for Psychology Today on everyday practicalities, including how to deal with total jerks. For 25 years, he has been a close research collaborator with Harvard Berkeley neuroscientist Terence Deacon. His latest book is called What's Up with Assholes? Advanced Psychoproctology for Beginners. Jeremy Sherman is all about making advanced ideas intuitive, practical, and funny. Because from a natural science perspective, the human condition is pretty ironic. So welcome, Jeremy. I'd like to get things kicked off with a little bit of your background, maybe where you were born and raised. Yeah, it's great to be here. Um, I, was, uh, I was born and raised in, on the south side of Chicago. Uh, a city famous for its fire, um, uh, and uh, into a, a, a pretty competitive family, uh, four boys, uh, um, a, a father and grandfather who were quite successful. Uh, we, were, uh, we were among those, uh, the Russian Jews who came over uh, uh, turn of the century, um, couldn't make it in regular businesses and ended up starting whole industries like the film industry came out of it. Um, my, my dad and grandfather started Midas mufflers. Um, and, uh, and my dad um, said we couldn't get into the business. We, he wouldn't allow us to go into his business unless we were 35 and failures because he kind of regretted having gone into his dad's business. He wanted us all to, uh, to branch out and do whatever. And he himself, he was, he, he was a, quite the colorful character. Uh, we had two greenhouses full of orchids and, um, and finches and hummingbirds. He played bagpipes. He played oboe. We had uh, three pianos in the home. Uh, he bought, I had a cow as a birthday gift because I, I was crazy about animals. I had a pet cow uh, on the south side of Chicago who I take for walks on the street. Um, it, it, very interesting fellow, and uh, he, he died young. But anyway, I have lived in a variety of places. I needed to get away from the competition. About 13, I went off to a boarding school where I didn't and actually have to attend classes for three years, seventh through ninth grade, and then came back and joined the family out in California. Um, and uh, I've had, yeah, I've done a variety of different things. I, I think of it as like uh, having had the luck to be able to take many of the rides in life's amusement park. Um, uh, I lived for seven years on the world's largest hippie commune in Tennessee. It was 1400 people. I did water projects in Guatemala. I've lived in England running public affairs for a, a, a green business, but the pretty famous one, the body shop, the one you see at the airport, they had about a thousand stores. And I was called in to radicalize the company, uh, the company because I was at the time running environmental, doing environmental work. I worked with Ben and Jerry's. I had founded a lobbying organization with 75 chapters. Um, and then around, around 38 or so, um, I would say in a really juicy midlife crisis, where I, you know, I, I cried a lot, but I also learned a lot. Um, uh, I turned my attention to what's up with us humans. I kind of got over, I had been sort of like one of these Buddhist pre-New Age, it was before the New Age, but, but kind of uh, 
you know, that kind, that kind of belief system, the new age or love is the answer crowd. And I was beginning to find that that wasn't actually going to carry me through life. I decided to, to move towards a scientific perspective, got really interested in evolutionary theory and then complexity theory, which is a, you know, related thing. And then ended up stumbling into the company of this Harvard neuroscientist it was kind of, uh, I, I felt grateful that he had time for me, but he had time for anybody who was interested in his questions. And they have really fueled me ever since. His big questions were, what is trying and how did it start? Chemical things don't try. You know, non-living things aren't trying to do anything. And here we are trying to do things. So how does, what is trying and how does it start? Uh, it's, a, it's a question that underlies a whole lot of what goes on in science and yet it gets, it's very poorly addressed in the sciences, if at all. Um, uh, how does language change who we, uh, our process of adaptation? That is, humans are um, adapting under the influence of this, it's, uh, of language, which makes us a very different kind of organism. And then in a way, a tie in from all my, my earlier work in activism, um, a real interest in evil and how people fall into the habits that make that evil possible. So that's what this, uh, this focus is, uh, psychoproctology, what's up with assholes, uh, <laughs> basically diagnosis, treatment and prevention of assholery. Um, very serious work, but, but you can't take that, you can't claim to, you can't take yourself very seriously in that work because a lot of assholes think they're the authorities on who's the assholes. So that's why I chose a light name for a serious subject. <laughs> Just to digress a little yeah, bit, yeah. what, uh, what was the boarding school that you went to and where was oh, that? So this was in upstate New York and, um, and I had begged, so before that, I was going to a very strict orthodox religious school, a yeshiva. My parents weren't that orthodox, but I hung out with, um, uh, you know, my, my buddies back then became uh, right wing, I would say, fascist rabbis. Um, so these were my best friends growing up, but we were not like that. We were, my dad thought a religious education was good and I needed an antidote to it. And there was a kind of school system back in the, in the 60s, I'm talking about, um, out of, it was modeled in, uh, in England by a school called Summerhill. And the idea at Summerhill was um, kids learn better when they're motivated to learn. And they're motivated to learn when you're not force feeding them from a fire hose. Um, you, so you give kids total freedom with their day. And you, you, there were only three rules at this school, which was no TV, no drugs, no alcohol. Um, and the hope was that kids would get bored enough that they'd find something interesting to do. And I ended, that ended up working well for me and a few others there. I mean, there are plenty of successes from there. One of the, one of the uh, head animators for, the head of animation for uh, The Simpsons was an old college, uh, old, old buddy of mine from back then. And all he did back then was, was I mean, I could tell back then he was going to become the head animator for The Simpsons. It was so obvious. He was one of the fortunate few who knew exactly what he was good for from an early age. But anyway, yeah, you had you, your day was free. And so I've been dealing for a while with what happens when you're freed up, when, they're, when you're not under obligation. And in a way, I've gravitated back towards that in my life, in that um, uh, I don't need obligations to keep me uh, in pursuit of my good projects. I, I work six, five, to, five to seven days a week. My work and my play are almost indistinguishable. Um, and uh, yeah, so, so I've ended up someone who, and between the inheritance I got young from Midas and uh, discovering the things that interested me more and more, I was able to remove the scaffold because it, it wasn't like I fell apart if I didn't have obligations. You know, there's a, uh, my research colleague, the guy I just mentioned, Terry Deacon, um, he says, you know, the, the self-employed have an idiot for a boss. And, um, but somehow I've, I've managed to, uh, to cultivate my own inner whip until I'm motivated to do the work that, that interests me and, I end up being fairly productive by that standard. Where did you earn your PhD? Is it ah, well, so, um, so the commune, let me just mention, the commune was halfway through my undergrad degree. So I missed seventh through ninth grade and then joined 
uh, a public high school in 10th grade. And, you know, if, it, if it's any indication, I was straight A's out of there. That is apparently you, uh, some people at least can miss seventh through ninth grade and, and, and hit the ground running, at least, you know, in the school I went to. Um, uh, the commune was like a boot camp. It was, uh, it was not your usual commune. It was not a free love commune at all. Um, uh, we worked really hard. So there was a way in which uh, that was quite motivating. Um, I came out of it and finished my undergrad at Berkeley and then did a master's in public policy at Berkeley because remember I was, as an activist, I was trying to figure out how to make things work better. Um, the degree in public policy, the master's was sobering for me. And in a way, that's what, that was part of the midlife crisis was realizing, actually, it's not easy to change humankind. It's not easy to save the world. At this time, uh, the, the whole age of Aquarius movement, which I am, a you could say, a member of, a victim of, a, a, a beneficiary of, um, was, uh, was just beginning to experience the backlash, the fierce backlash. That is, we thought that everybody's just going to wake up and 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 start to be generous and kind and all that sort of stuff. Not not no. <laughs> there was a there was a major backlash at that time. So it sobered me up, and then I ended up doing the undergrad a few years later after the master's in public policy, um, uh, in a school that's not of high prestige. It's called Union Institute and University. But the advantage of it was that I could bring in the top professors I could find anywhere in the, in the world to be on my PhD committee. So that's how I got the Harvard neuroscientist. Scientist. That's how I got the Dean of Psychology at University College of London and uh, one of the foremost living experts on social psychology who was at Bolt, uh, at, he was at, at Berkeley at the time and then moved to Stanford. So I had, I, I had a kick-ass committee uh, but the school's the school's uh, prestige is low, um, and it and it has shown up at times. Occasionally, I'll, I I remember sitting and having um, dinner with uh, the Nobel Prize winner who invented the laser, and he asked me where I went to where I got my PhD, and um, it was not too impressive. <laughs> we had a good conversation anyway, but 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 yeah. <laughs> how did how did that work? Where okay, you grew up in on the south side of Chicago, you went to um, school in upstate New York, and then you lived in a commune in Tennessee, and you said you joined your family in California. So, sorry, the California, so California, I can't, so my dad became, incre so I think I, I, I kind of touched on this earlier. My dad was a little restless having gone into his dad, his dad's business. He was really into the humanities. I mean, he, he, he was deep into classical music, deep into classical literature. He was kind of famous as an orator. Um, he kind of talked like Shakespeare. He was very intimidating to be around. I was, I was uh, tongue-tied through most of my youth. Um, between him and my two older brothers who could just dance circles around me, I was a real late bloomer. So when I left the, so, my dad and my grandfather got in a fight because my dad was beginning to radicalize Midas Muffler. So he's the CEO of Midas, he's the president of Midas Muffler, and he's hanging out with the Chicago Seven, Saul Alinsky, Ralph Nader, Jesse Jackson, and, and he's becoming more, he didn't start out this way, but he just realized more and more that he wanted to work on saving the world, it got, and it turned into a conflict. And at one point, my dad decided he's just gonna move the whole family uh, to California. Um, it, the obvious move for a guy like this. Um, and in effect, he summoned me home from the free school. He said, we're all moving to California. So we moved to Mill Valley, which is in Marin County. I don't know if you know that, that place by reputation. Um, now, Mill Valley, uh, so you got the San Francisco Peninsula, and it's, it's opposite, it's mirror opposite on the, in the north is Marin County. And uh, it's where the redwood forests are. Um, it's kind of a Garden of Eden. And it's where all the rock stars were living during the 60s. And um, yeah, so that's where I, that's where I spent my, uh, uh, some more formative years. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, no, it was a very lucky place to hang. It was just, it was, yeah. <laughs> no, I, I, this is, this is, it's dumb luck. I've just had an incredibly lucky life and I kind of have to acknowledge it 
or else people will think I made it. I didn't make it. I, I mean, this, I, just, I just ended up with an incredible amount of freedom uh, and, um, and even more beneficial than that, things worth doing with it. Now, I can't say that they're worth doing by the world standards. That anybody, anybody who thinks they're part of the solution is the problem as far as I'm concerned. Um, but, but at least I, I'm, my happiness comes from having work for which I have infinite patience. And so I'm a happy chappy. I got, I've just got lots, I've got lots going on these days, lots of interesting questions I work on, um, lots of great colleagues to do it with and have had that for a while. I mean, the, the, the people I got to grow up with setting aside the, uh, the, the right-wing fascist rabbis I grew up with, <laughs> but, but otherwise it's been, re- it's been a really nice hang. I've got good buddies. <laughs> Your life sounds amazing. I, I, I really want to, like I, I want to kind of get an idea of what laid the groundwork for your latest book. Like what what made you contemplate the age old question, "What's up with assholes?" Yeah. So um, uh, part of it is personal, and I almost never talk about this. So this is this is an exclusive for your show. Awesome. Which is which is that I, um, I have three children, and the first one um, was a paradox for me. Um, uh, he, he's my firstborn child, my pride and joy. Um, and uh, I am, a, as his father, I'm to love him unconditionally. And I'm also supposed to, to make sure that my kids don't grow up to be assholes. That's kind of important. Um, he ended up having ambiguous challenges. Uh, there are some people with mental disabilities who uh, inspire sympathy immediately. Like if you've got an autistic kid or, uh, or someone with mental retardation, uh, people know how to accommodate you. Um, my son, my firstborn son, um, had problems that that didn't inspire sympathy, and we uh, they he he behaved in ways that looked like I had more work to do to make sure he didn't grow up to be uh, a ripoff, an asshole. Um, and working with that, that's actually how I got into the PhD program. I, I realized I was up against a fundamental challenge, which was what whether he was indulgent or handicapped. So those are two opposite diagnoses. That is, you're trying to assess your situation and they have opposite consequences. If someone is handicapped, you don't push them, you accommodate them. If someone is indulgent and you're their father, you push them. So you can't both push and accommodate on the same factors at the same time. So I I ended up calling this acids, ambiguous cues, incompatible do's. So, uh, and this would also come up, by the way, any first responder is dealing with an issue like this, that is triage, all of that relates to this in a way. ambiguous cues. You can't tell whether you're in situation A or B. Incompatible do's. The things you would do in situation A are the opposite of the things you would do in situation B. If he's indulgent, you push him. If he's handicapped, you accommodate him. Um, I got really interested in those kinds of tough judgment calls. Um, That's why I went back and got a PhD in decision theory crossed with evolutionary theory. So it's the, the technical name, it's, it's a $10 term and it shouldn't be that fancy because it's actually way more intuitive than that. It's called an evolutionary epistemology. Epistemology is basically how you shop among interpretations. And evolutionary means that all organisms are shopping among interpretations. They're not doing it consciously and they're not doing it necessarily with feelings, but even trees have to interpret and respond to their circumstances. So that was where I, that's how I got back to school there. Now, in the meantime, all that work and activism what had me thinking about bad behavior. And not only that, working among the new agers who thought they were the antidote to bad behavior, I started to realize, oh no, you can do it with new age ideas too. You can be a new age asshole. It's perfectly possible to be a Buddhist asshole. You can be a polite asshole, it's, you know, it, it, same bullshit, different branding, you know? So um, 
So in a way, the commune's answers became the springboards to my next questions, which are what do what's what are the generic qualities? What do all of them have in common? What do all assholes have in common? And by the way, I cannot rule out the possibility that I'm an asshole. After all, assholes are 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 uh, famously expert at assuming that they're not. Um, you know, <laughs> people who are sure they're part of the problem are part of the solution are the problem as far as I'm concerned. So I'm not ruling myself out there. I wouldn't put it past me. But, <laughs> but, but the core question became for me, what is a butthead? Since it can't just be whoever you happen to butt heads with. And that became like a koan, like a Buddhist koan for me, though, without the Buddhist over, uh, overlay. It just became a question that got really interesting to me. And obviously, um, Watching the backlash and seeing the, the growth, and you know, you may have a very diverse uh, audience, whatever, but I, I could see the, in, the, the, the rise of a bunch of the fascistly incline, inclined bravado, brave boy stuff showing up on all sides. Like I say, um, you know, that you could you can do this under any guise. I don't think of it as a difference in values. People, it's not about values with assholes. The, you know, values are lip service. They're window dressing. They're they're cover. Um, you know, Stalin wasn't a leftist. He wasn't a communist. He was an asshole. Hitler wasn't an anti-Semite. Primarily, he would have done whatever. He's an asshole. And I would say the same about Trump. And I that's one of the things that I love about uh, studying Trump closely is that it would be very hard to mistake him for having values. He's like crystalline, pristine, pure essence of the behavior that one engages in, in assholery. And I would say that if he was pandering to the left, it's not about what they believe, it's how they strut it. So he's been, he was certainly a, a, a key asshole muse for me as I was writing this book. Um, but I have to make sure, uh, make very clear, it is not a partisan book. Like I say, it wouldn't matter who he's pandering to. That's not the point. It, it, it's not about what they believe. They don't have beliefs, I don't think. It's, it's something more fundamental than that. And it does relate to the, the whole origins of life research, all the stuff on what goes on with organisms and the stuff about the evolution of language. All of that relates it, in a way it's a natural conclusion from that work that I would start to pay attention to the ways that assholery would be a problem anywhere there was intelligent life anywhere in the universe. If we mean by intelligent life organisms that can use language, language makes us an unusually anxious species. Just compare what you could worry about at night to what a dog could worry about at night. We got way more to worry about and language also affords us a way to pretend it away. So escapism comes really naturally to people. And so, you know, one way to describe it is that we all engage in some of that escapism. It's called confirmation bias. That is, you keep out the disappointing news and you let in the affirming news. That's what confirmation bias is. And normal people treat confirmation bias as a problem of that they, they own it as a problem they have to manage for themselves. And assholes treat confirmation bias as a solution to all their problems. That's, that's one simple description of what's going on with them from my perspective. Um, it's a fire hose. It's a fire hose. It's a, I mean, because I think about this stuff all day. You know, I have the luxury to think about it all day. It's just on my mind. So, And, and most of my stuff, it's really simple stuff. It's just, it's just not that familiar. We, you said the age-old question about what makes an asshole, and yet it's strange. In psychology, you are not allowed to talk about assholes. I write articles about assholes that get rejected by psychology today. You can talk about narcissists. You can talk about psychopaths. In fact, that's the bread and butter for, for a lot of pop psychology is how can, I, uh, how can I reasonably diagnose my ex as a narcissist? That's okay. But to talk about assholes is different. Um, and not so, so in a way, it's an unfamiliar question. And this other one, the, the one that's at the origins, the core of all my work, this stuff about what is trying and how did it start? We're all obsessed with ourselves. The selves are the things that try. I mean, a, a bacterium is a self. So we're, we're self obsessed, we humans, and we're obsessed with trying to figure out what to try to do. But we almost never step back and ask, what is a self and what is trying? I mean, the entire field of psychology knows 
motivation only by its consequences. If we see effort, we assume there's a motivation. But my work is on explaining motivation out of chemistry. That is, you start with chemistry, simple chemistry, and you've got to explain how the first motivated system could ever emerge from it. It's origins of life research. Totally unfamiliar question to most folks. They just never, you know, what is trying? You know, your, your computer isn't trying, the moon isn't trying to pull on the tides, and yet a bacterium is trying to live. Okay, so, so what is it? And how did it start? <laughs> Simple questions, unfamiliar. What have, you, what have you come up with so far? Oh, we, so we've got a full theory of how the first trying could start from chemistry anywhere in the universe. And it's actually a really simple model. It has to be because trying starts before evolution. You know, there's a general assumption often, even held by scientists, that evolution is this new regime that kicks in in the universe and then it starts life. But we know that's not true. We know that evolution is well understood, but that the origins of life remains a big question. Now, the way most folks go at the origins of life question is they think, well, DNA is information or a blueprint. And once you get these copying molecules, that's the beginning of life. Well, no, copiers copying things, a pattern copying is not trying to copy. There's lots of that in the universe. I mean, if you took a sterile planet and you put a jillion photocopiers on it and plug them all in, what would you have? You'd have a sterile planet. Copying isn't enough. So um, our model is simple. It's basically a chain reaction that as a byproduct puts out these molecules that happen to form shells. They're called capsid molecules. They're, they're common enough among basic proteins. So what you end up with is this, this, this um, chain reaction and these shells form nearby it and capture some of the chain reaction molecules and they drift off. And then if they break open again, the chain reaction will start. So this would be the beginning of self-repair. Um, and self-repair or healing, and not in the new age sense, but just healing, patching, you know, patching up what, what degenerates, would be essential for living beings. So computers don't self-repair at all, um, uh, but we have to self-repair all the time. So on a slouchy day, yesterday was a Sunday, I, I was, it was a chill day for me. I, I generated 240 billion new cells yesterday. I mean, and I did that without even thinking about it or feeling it at all. That is, we have to hustle to outpace degeneration. Uh, we're, we're breaking down all the time. We're actually quite fragile. You know, uh, uh, at death, we decompose really fast. We're not durable. We're not, we're, we don't exist because we're durable. We exist because we hustle all day, mostly unconsciously, to regenerate ourselves faster than we would otherwise degenerate. So when you got these little shell things that I just describing that are basically like seeds for a chain reaction, if it breaks open, it chain reacts again and generates more of these shells, which would happen to capture some of the chain reaction. So that would be, that's how we see the beginning of evolution as feasible. That is, I'm not, we're not claiming that, that that's the way it happened. We're just, show, you can say this is a feasibility test. That is, up until now, no one's had a way to describe how chemistry could ever start trying to repair itself. And remember trying, it's a, you know, we think of it mostly in terms of consciousness and wanting and all that, but this you know, bacteria are trying too. So that's the beginning of it. We can then explain how you'd end up with DNA from that, how you'd end up with a kind of, first there's a kind of a model that uh, where it's more likely to break open in the presence of the fuel that makes the chain reaction possible. So this is the first kind of decision-making. Um, when there's no fuel around, stay closed. When there's fuel around, open. And then we have a, a, a slightly more complicated model for how DNA or template molecules could, could become part of the story. Um, but this has been the, the joy. I mean, like, I, I think I mentioned this. I, I, I took a walk this morning, just before this, I took a walk with uh, Terry, the research colleague, and we're just jamming nonstop. We, we work on how to 
further flesh out the theory, the questions that arise from the theory, how to build out from them. At first, he was very wary to work with a social scientist. He's a neuroscientist and he didn't want, and also I mostly write pop psych. So he, he was very wary that, wary that I was gonna dumb down his theory, but we've been jamming for 25 years. He knows that I'm really paying close attention. And then, and that dumbing down is really hard work. In fact, to make stuff accessible you know, right. advanced psychopractology. So, so by now there's a lot of mutual respect and we just, we just work on new pieces of the theory. We were working on a piece of it today. Um, uh, yeah, so that's, that's fun. And there's a, something fundamental different about what we're doing in our scientific research. We're interested in how, we're not interested in describing, we're interested in explaining and explaining from origins. So, we can come up with all, all sorts of speculation about what motivation is, but to explain it from its origins is the best way to figure out what's really going on. And that's what I did with the psychoproctology book too. I said, if we really wanna understand, you know, everybody's got their opinion about who the assholes are, but let's actually work it out from their origins. There are plenty of, there are plenty of animals or biological organisms that are para, uh, parasites or super predators but no, asshole is actually a human thing. So you have to explain it from the origins of language, which is really what makes us distinctively human. And, and there is a connection, I, sorry, I, I'm going long and I'm, I'm happy to pause, but there is a connection to the leadership question that I could mention. Yes, absolutely. In order to survive, we have to regenerate. To regenerate, we have to take in things that we can use to regenerate ourselves. That means we have to take in energy and resources and channel into them into self-repair, okay? And we have to keep out the other stuff because if there's one thing that will uh, do us in, and a firefighter would certainly know this, it's energy. So energy is a paradoxical thing for us. We need it to live, but at the same time, nothing degenerates us faster than energy. That's why insulation has to be of the right inert material, pi uh, pipe has to be durable stuff because you got energy flowing through it. So all organisms are dealing with what I'll call selective interaction. They have to interact with the right stuff, not the wrong stuff. They have to take in water and they, don't, they, don't, they, they can't take in poison, okay? And so in humans with language, that means taking in the ideas that uh, uh, regenerate our mojo, our motivation, and keeping out the ideas that would demotivate us. That's confirmation bias. In now jumping way forward to the Renaissance. So in the Renaissance, you didn't have, you didn't have nation states, you had city states. And um, uh, um, Florence was under attack from Milan and was under siege, it was in serious trouble. And then the head of Milan got um, the equivalent to COVID-19 and he died. So he died in the plague. And, uh, some of the intellectuals of the Renaissance, uh, some of the big names in that, um, sighed a sigh of relief and says, our problem is we don't have a strong citizenship. Our, our citizens are not that wise. That By citizens, they don't mean the slaves, they mean the liberated uh, individuals. And this was the rebirth of the liberal arts education. So by liberal, what they meant is free agents, as maybe... Uh, and, you know, this is the education for the, uh, for the non-slaves. Um, and they returned to something that was old and called the trivium. And the trivium was three subjects. It was logic, rhetoric, and grammar. Now, I've gotten really interested in the, those three, and I would revise it a little bit. I, I would come up with a novum trivium. But basically, what is logic? It's basically bullshit detecting. It's unspinning spun stuff. So we, it's basically the antidote to rhetoric. But these guys were not just trying to teach people to be rational. They also were trying to teach them how to spin, how to do rhetoric. So it's rhetoric and logic. So how to spin and unspin. This is what they thought was essential for the citizens of a viable community. It wasn't just about, it was, a, it was as much about meme making as uh, decoding and finding the bullshit in a meme. You know, memes are all flowerful, flowery and they, and they make you swoon and all this sort of stuff. And you say right on and all that. And you don't look for exceptions to whatever 
uh you know someone is sweepingly generalized in the meme like you know uh you know it, it follow your bliss it'll always work or whatever or, you know um so that pairing got really interesting to me how to spin how to unspin and i would replace grammar grammar is crucial to both of those things but i would replace it with how to do both even-handedly so how to unspin your own arguments and how to spin up your opponent's arguments um, because uh, even Socrates got this. He says the problem with learning logic is that the main thing you'll do with it is you'll use it to attack anybody who's a rival to whatever your gut impulses are. So he had, I mean, a, a lot of the, the Socratic dialogues are dealing with this problem of sophists. And sophists were basically the spin doctors of the day. They were the, you know, the, the, yeah, spin doctors, or the lawyers and spin doctors of the day. So how to spin, how to unspin, and how to do both even-handedly, it became kind of central to my work. And it's central, I would say, to this business of um, knowing that we're all dealing with confirmation bias and recognizing that I have to manage my own confirmation bias to the extent I can. That is, I have to be able to see through my own rhetoric. Um, and that's, that's poison, that's kryptonite to an asshole. That's the last thing they want to do is, is, is self-observe, kick the tire on their own ideas. You know, they got a few, they, they have gut beliefs and they tack weld them to a couple of facts and uh, they're done. They're learned, <laughs> you know, <laughs> they're not learning. So, so I, I think that's an interesting, I think it's an interesting parallel worth drawing that we need all leaders whether it be of a family or of a business or whatever, um, even of one's own life, has to, has to both develop a capacity to spin stuff, um, including self-flattery, but also to see through it. And for me, irony is the heart of that. Irony is the opposite of hypocrisy. It's where you recognize, it's a kind of humility, self-effacing, where you, you know that you're guessing what's true and what's not true. Um, and uh, you're okay with that. And you're willing to put your cards on the table that you know that you use rhetoric with yourself. You know that you've got confirmation bias, that sort of thing. <laughs> Pretty interesting. Never thought of it that way. Yeah, yeah it's, um, it does relate back to that thing I said about what got me into decision theory in the first place. I got really interested in tough judgment calls. I think they're way more fundamental than principles, moral principles. And if you look at the popular moral principles, they are all self-negating. That is, they contradict themselves. They sound hypocritical. So you shouldn't be judgment, you shouldn't be judgmental is a judgment. That is, it's saying you shouldn't. Do not be negative is negative. Commit yourself to flexibility is a, uh, is a commitment. Be intolerant of intolerance is itself intolerant. And a hypocrite will look at that stuff, a cynical hypocrite, and say, ha ha, it's all bullshit. I can say whatever I want. I can do whatever I want. An, a, a fallibilist ironist, so fallibilist is a word I need to unpack. It's a term out of philosophy. It just means that we know that we can't be, we can never achieve 100% certainty on anything, that any, any bet could fail. Doesn't mean all bets are equally good. But a fallibilist ironist looks at that and says, oh, you see that contradiction? That means that lifelong, I'm going to have to deal with this question, when to be tolerant and when to be intolerant, when to judge, when to not judge, when to be negative, when not to be negative, that it's a lifelong question. And, I'm, and for that, the serenity prior is just killer. It's just great. It really nails down the problem. You're lifelong, you're questing or praying for wisdom to notice the differences that make a difference to when you should do this or do that. And so that, that has ended up being the source of the greatest peace of mind I've ever gotten is just to recognize I'm a fallibilist ironist. So I can, I can look back at all sorts of mistakes I've made in my life. I mean, I've wasted my whole life uh, learning things I now already know. You know? So, 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 but, but, you know, I can stand corrected my dignity intact that the whole point is to adjust and recognize I couldn't get it perfect. Um, you know, that's just not part of life. It's actually fundamental to trying. No organism gets it, nails it perfectly. You know, just when you figure out the formula, the formula changes. 
That's the most disappointing thing from Darwin, not that there's a diminished role for God or that we came from apes, but that there's no surefire formula. And, that, and, and people, it's quite understandable, anxious bunnies like us with language and all these possible problems would be craving a formula by which to live. Um, but the, the cost of that is, is a kind of regret that I no longer have to deal with anymore, at least at my level of damage doing. That is, I do, you know, I, I make mistakes, but I can usually repair them, patch them up. Um, I'm not plagued by them. You know, even when you have high consequences, there, there's a general assumption that the more leverage you have, like if you're a fire chief or a president, the more certainty you can gain. It's not true at all. The bigger the, the, bigger the challenges, the more leverage you've got, the bigger the clusterfuck. It's, it's actually harder to make realistic right decisions. So, and all of us can choose right and the outcome can be wrong. So that, and that's just, there's no escaping that. There's only pretending you've escaped that. So another way to think about assholes is that they're fake infallibilists. They think they have a formula or they don't even bother, they don't even bother coming up with one. They just award themselves the status of someone who has the formula and then they make it up as they go along. <laughs> but but uh, I mean, but yeah, and but that that would be a natural response to a feeling like you 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 failed because you what I call robo envy. You wish you were a robot who nailed everything perfectly. Now we're humans. We're we're organisms. We're trying. <laughs> Yoda was completely wrong. There's only trying. As I, as I'm thinking through everything you just said, I'm I'm trying to I'm I'm trying to see where because I've been teaching leadership for for quite some time now, to put what you just said in kind of simple terms where you know, you're talking about the logic and the rhetoric yeah. and, and then knowing when to use each of them and really- Or, or guessing well when to use each of them. I don't think you can know, but, you, but that's, that is a big question. I, I, how, you know, I think of it as a distinction between decided and deciding, radically different states of mind. And so I, I've coined the term spin doctor Hippocratic Oath. The spin doctor Hippocratic Oath is when you're deciding, employ the power of neutral thinking or the power of opposite think thinking so you can see both sides of an issue. Once you've decided, spin it hard. So that's what a leader has to do. But yeah, even when you're spinning it hard, at least from my perspective, you still have to harbor a dinghy of doubt. That is somewhere in the back of your mind, you have to keep open the possibility that you've guessed wrong. Um, so how you do that is an interesting, interesting question. Buddhist, uh, it's a Buddhist saying, uh, though my heart is on fire, my eyes are cold as ashes. And there's something about, or, or you could take, there's a Quaker saying that's related, build it to last a hundred years, be ready to leave tomorrow. There's also one from journalism. Um, I want to keep an open mind, but I don't want my brains to spill out. So all of these are about managing that tension between deciding and decided. But I'm also operating on the assumption that I will decide too soon or too late that that comes with the territory. I'm trying to minimize both of those errors. There's no escaping them. I'm just trying to minimize them. That's why I need to keep on cultivating the wisdom to notice the differences that make a difference to when I should do one thing or its opposite. Oh, By the that's... way, I did sell this stuff for a while as leadership training, and, and my reviews were, were um, they were, uh, uh, what, do you, what do you call it? They were, they were markedly split. There were people who thought I was the worst piece of shit to ever show up at the business, total crackpot. And there were people who thought I was the best thing they had ever seen in, in leadership training. <laughs> well, it's, it's, it's interesting how, so if you put it in the context of the, the fire department, yeah, there's the personnel issues, and then there's the the leading in high stress environments. So there's the leadership at the station when it's just, you know, doing daily tasks, the mundane training, yep. all of that sort of stuff. 
And then there's the, the leadership in high stress environments. Yes. Both. Oh, they're, so you gotta, you gotta be really human with the people on your staff, really comforting and reassuring and affirming and all of that. And then when on the scene of the fire, I mean, I'm just asking whether this is what you're talking about. It's um, the, yours is not to wonder why, yours is to do or die. I mean, you're, you're out in the field and that's the priority, right? Right. Yeah. And, and the, the minimizing the mistakes is consistent on, on both sides. Because yeah, that's right. When, that's right. Yeah. When you're leading the people, you know, developing them, uh, I, I always say that as a leader, you're, you're out, when you take that position, you've obligated yourself to ensure the success of your people. But to do that, you have to know them. And yeah. it's difficult to ever truly know somebody. And yeah. no, I don't it, even I don't even know myself. Let's be clear on that. I mean, <laughs> right. when you're in a high stress environment, there are so many things acting upon you and you're you're trying to make decisions in fractions of a second and hoping that you get it right. That's right. Based, based on previous experience that may or may not be exactly what you're dealing with in that instant. Right. Yeah, it's, it's really interesting how, how you've stated it, um, but to, to really distill it down, it's as a leader, you're, you're trying to minimize the mistakes that you make. <laughs> yes, of course, that's right. And, and, and remembering that, so, so for me, the closest I get to confidence is when I'm equally anxious on opposite sides of something. Um, I, I've noticed recently that we treat arrogant and too arrogant as synonymous, as it meaning the same thing. And actually, what I want to be is the right quantity of arrogant or assertive, which means that I want to be equally anxious about whether I'm not sufficiently assertive or too assertive. And if, if there's rough balance, that's about as close as I get. I don't feel like I can ever notch it and just nail the perfect middle way between the two. I like to see myself oscillating between opposite um, opposites on, on any of those things. Now, arrogant is pejorative, but you could call it assertive. All of these, all of these dilemmas have words that make them positive, so sound positive, or words that make them negative sounding. So arrogant sounds bad, self-assertive sounds good. Uh, you could also describe it in neutral terms as uh, persisting in a conviction despite new evidence. I mean, you could, so there's a positive ease, negative ease, neutral ease for each of these terms. I like to keep them all in mind. That's part of that power of neutral thinking I was talking about. Um, but Seems I was very Taoist. Yes, it is. It is Taoist in that respect. And, and the Tao actually has more irony going on it than most religions. Most religions are, are pretty damn humorless. Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, so, but here's another connection to what you were talking about in the in the firehouse or in in that work. A little bit of a story. I have a friend who's a a, a fellow professor. He goes off to teach. Goes off to um to consider teaching at this local school, a local college. This is California, so it's a kind of a new age college. And he goes and and he hears the lect uh, a, a lecture by the dean of education, um, and he asks a question during it. What do you think about rigor? And she said, you mean rigor mortis? You know, it's a new age college where they're thinking, you know, you don't have to think, you don't have to be rigorous. And then he said, no, I mean intimacy. And, now, you, know, you know, new agers love intimacy. So she said, ah, oh, right on, right on. I think there was a misreading of the, uh, uh, between the two of them. My guy was, the, the guy I know, he was a, he got a Columbia PhD in, um, in uh, philosophy of science. Um, close colleague of Jerry Brown. He, uh, he was, a, he's responsible. This, this cat I'm talking about was responsible for all the windmills uh, here in California. He was like, his windmills are. So he's, he, I think there's a difference between intimacy with reality and intimacy with other people. And I'd actually break it down one further step. I've got to fit or be intimate with three different realms fundamentally. I got to be intimate with reality. 
That is, if there's one rule that has worked for the last 3.8 billion years, it's adapt to reality or die, okay? But I also have to be intimate with other people because they're part of my reality now. And the third one is I got to be intimate with myself. That is, I have to have comfort in my own skin. Okay, so those three intention, and that's a human issue, that it's not all organisms have all of that going on. They don't have the social world we have. But you could say in the long run, being intimate with reality, fitting reality matters most of all. In the short run, feeling comfortable in our own skins feels the most pressing. And in between is the social world. Because so, the social world can either give you reality checks or it can be a, a cult that just uh, satisfies your need to feel comfort in your own skin. It can represent reality or it can represent whatever satisfies you. You know, society can get way off uh, out of touch with reality. So when you're when you're describing the work in fire uh, firefighting leadership, you've got to have this intimacy with other people, and you've got to have intimacy with reality. Um, and you're balancing those two, and it's do or die. I mean, it's really. I mean, I'm awestruck by the work you guys do. My, I was I was a fire chief for a tiny town. I mean, I dealt with a couple of barn fires. It was nothing like what you dealt with. Um, so there's all that. In the meantime, what you were describing, the overarching thing is the discomfort of being in that position of responsibility about it. It's also an interesting tell that um, you feel that anxiety. My, my core principle is if you don't want to be an asshole, expect some anxiety. Um, People who wonder if they're assholes are less likely to be assholes than people who are certain they're not. But the people who end up in positions of power are often reckless because really they, they aren't struggling with the difference between reality and other people. Their only question is how to feel comfort in my own skin or pleasure in my own skin. It's a form of masturbation. And they'll pander to whomever to, in order to feel that comfort in their own skin and reality be damned. That's not so. Those are the people who are more likely to look confident. Um, you know, that's, you can say there's a confidence paradox, paradox. The more confident you are, the less confident you should be. I just made that up. I'm not sure it's true, um, but there's something like that going on. It seems to me. I, I've had very similar conversations. Not um, probably a little more rudimentary. With, with some of my buddies, you know, discussing fire department leadership, but, uh, and, you know, the, the lack thereof in uh, some areas. But I, I want to, uh, there's one last thing I should say relevant to this. Um, in firefighting, you get results, you know, the consequences, and you know them rather immediately. There are other areas where that's less the case. Um, there's a joke about this. A guy's uh, boasting about his marriage and success. And someone says, what, what's, what do you attribute it to? And he says, well, it's easy. My wife makes all the little decisions. I make all the big decisions. I said, can you give me an example? He said, sure. My wife decides where we live, where I work, where the kids go to school, where we vacation. And I decide whether the U.S. should invade Iraq. Okay, so there are big decisions, the lofty ones, the philosophical or theological ones, where you get no immediate feedback. You can believe anything and get away with it. And that's where the, that's where the pandering, the self-pandering, comfort in your own skin or pleasing other people is going to work best. In firefighting, if you fuck up, it shows. It's like surgery. It's a very different field. Philosophy is hard because it's so easy. Any schmuck can do it. <laughs> but but fire firefighting, you know, you, you got you will pay if you guessed wrong. Yeah. Or even if you guessed right and it turned out wrong, because all guesses are possible are probability things. That's the you know, they're not certainties, or else you wouldn't be guessing. <laughs> One of the things that I'm I'm curious about, because in in leadership, it's a lot to do with relationships. And, and it seems as though we've kind of touched on it, sort of, but I, I was wondering if in your research about assholery, you've come across, you know, some, something that would kind of uh, lend 
an understanding of how to make um, relationships work better. Yeah. Um, yes, I, ha I have uh, an idea or a notion related to that. A minute, a minute ago, I was talking about having to adapt in three different environments, the reality, society, and comfort in our own skins. Um, I actually think of those reality as the likely story, society as the liked story, the story that people like, and comfort in my own skin as the likable story. Now, I end up working with all sorts of researchers now, and I would say that some of them are trying to maximize the likeliness of their liked story or of their, yeah, of their liked or likely, uh, likable story. That is, they got some gut intuition that makes them feel comfort and they're basically trying to find a little science to support it. So they start with their intuition about what feels good, what feels right, and they ornament it with some science. Um, my interest is different from that. And a lot of that is coming from working with this Harvard neuroscientist who, who employs the power of neutral thinking in impressive ways to me. That is, it really impresses me how neutrally he looks at things. This is kind of what science is about in the whole, in the first place. It's saying to get what you want, set aside what you want long enough to see what is, and then better informed, you'll have, you'll have better chances of getting what you want. So from our perspective, what we're trying to do is maximize the likability of the likely story. As you start with the, you start with your best guess at how reality really works. And when we talk about that, we're not, we're talking about likelinesses. That is some possibilities are more likely than others. You know, this building will cave in before we can get out or, or not, you know, we're talking about probabilities basically. So how you, how you sell that stuff, how you sell the likely so that it's likable is the heart of it and that's what so you you want your rhetoric you want to start with an unspun story if you can i mean this is an idealization an unspun story and figure out how to spin it you don't start with your spin story and then dress it up so it looks like it was unspun you know i, I i'm i just amazed I, you know for the work on the psychoproctology book i i did a whole lot of interactions with trolls and one of the things that blew my mind with them was they would come out of the box saying that they were critical thinkers now, I have a PhD in critical thinking, and no, I would never claim I'm a critical thinker. That's, you don't get to do that. Who are you to say that you're that thing? I call it talk is walkism. Whatever I say about myself must be true. Um, and I would ask them why they thought they were critical thinkers. And I mean, their answers were absurd. Um, I think that it came down to this. Critical thinking is a source of credibility. It's what the cool kids are wearing. So fuck it. I'll say I'm a critical thinker. Doesn't mean I have to change anything about my behavior, but I'm a realist. I hereby declare myself a realist. So that's the other end of the spectrum. That's the asshole end of the spectrum. This is basically, and I do think of it as like a kind of self-pleasuring. And so that's the other part of this I'll mention in a minute. But the business, a, a, a firefighting leader, a fire chief, has to somehow figure out ways to motivate people to deal with reality. And you're dealing with people of very different temperaments and very different styles. And you're also dealing with them as a group, which is a challenge. That is, you know, dealing with individuals one-on-one -on -one is one thing, but once you're dealing with a bunch of people, then you have to be kind of consistent. And at the same time, you have to speak to different audiences. So there's all of that challenge. But what you're trying to do is represent reality to them um, they may not be paying as much attention to uh, how to save their lives and their fellow, you know, fellow firefighters' lives. I mean, probably they are, but there's a way you have to earn their respect. And in the long run, that will come from representing reality and not having a lot of casualties as a result. Now, there's one more piece to this, which is um, I think it's totally unrealistic to assume that humans could ever be totally realistic. Is I think escapism is inescapable for us. It, it, there's just way too much world. If you've got language, you can imagine all sorts of real and imaginary threats and missed opportunities. I mean, there's plenty of reason to stay up all night if you're a human. And a dog doesn't have that issue. That language just overwhelms us. So I think escapism is inescapable. So a lot of my work is also on safe escapism, optimal illusion, how to kid ourselves in ways that help more than they harm. 
Um, uh, and I do have, we have, we have good examples of that. You know, I watch fiction. I, I watch a lot of TV at the end of the day. Um, it, cause TV is just incredibly good these days. It's uh, the, not all of it, but you can find incredibly good stuff. I mean, I, I work with literature professors who say, no, this stuff's, this stuff's richer than most novels. Um, uh, when I'm watching, I totally believe it's true. But I know it's not true. Shakespeare had a great line about this. He says, when my love says she is made of truth, I do believe her, though I know she lies. He says that. And, and the, the whole sonnet goes on like that about how they're both, it's a, thus, in, it's a, it's a, thus I lie with her and she with me, and in our fault by lies we flattered be, is how it ends. So it's about kidding each other. There's a way in which you have to humor each other. Um, uh, and, and humor yourself. So self-humoring is a huge part of it. And fiction's a great example of how we do it. You know, you're totally in it, you totally believe it, and you know it's not true. Um, I just wish we did that in more different arenas. As far as I'm, I've been to a Trump rally. It's actually no different from what I can tell from a heavy metal concert. It's cosplay and people go in and they act all badass and uh, they engage in what I call we glee, the glee of being a smart internal set, not like those loser dumbasses out there. And they sing along with the lyrics. They're not paying any attention to what the lyrics mean. They just, they love the bravado. It just sounds badass. And then the only difference between them is that at the end of the metal concert, people find their cars and go back to reality. Whereas at the end of a Trump rally, they go out and they think that they have something more real than reality. So to me, it's not at all a question of how far out you go in your illusions. It's whether you remember to come back. You know, you, you take your flights of fancy, take your flights of fancy, but always with a return ticket to reality in your heart pocket. So how to get that across, how to make that work, how to do that in a team where you got the real world is really pressing on you. The alarm is going off all the time. I mean, not all the time, but any time. You know, you're on the, and, and this actually relates to a whole field of psych, uh, psychological research which might interest you. Um, it's called terror management theory. Um, and it starts with a guy who's basically pointing out that we are the first organisms who can foresee in detail the inevitability of our own deaths. So here we are uh, throwing all in, knowing for sure that we will be thrown out. And he does all the, and the, the field researches what happens when you prime people on their deaths, on their own inevitable deaths. And the evidence is quite strong that people dig in their heels on whatever their what he calls immortality projects are. So I'll be dead, but what I stand for will live on forever. Um, well, you firefighters, you're primed on death daily. It's, I mean, that's what you're, you're preparing for. It. And this most bizarre of situations where half the time you're just killing time, not half the time, but more than that, you're killing time. And then suddenly you're on the edge of your, you know, you're on the edge of death. So, yeah, I mean, it's, 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 downright cosmic work in that respect very Taoist you know though my heart is on fire my eyes are cold as ashes it, you know all that sort of stuff it's it's intense work I'm impressed by people who do it I can I can sit here all day and do my philosophizing I mean there are earthquakes out here but my house my house is secure I'm gonna be okay not firefighters it's a different world <laughs> one of the things that I, I you know just to kind of go off on a tangent about what you're talking about. Um, yeah. You know, I, I love California. I, you know, I had a great time in San Francisco and Berkeley and, uh, you know, anywhere where there was huge disasters, you know, there's like Manhattan, Chicago, Boston, San Francisco, you know, where there was these great fires yeah. that, and you know, walk in the hills in San Francisco and you see the bricks that were melted and they used them or left them in place or something. I yeah. don't know what it, but there's, 
there's monuments and, and plaques to the firefighters that yeah that you know gave their lives trying to save others and it um it just it, it it brought it home for me you know having been a firefighter for for 23 years and, and visiting these places that there isn't really any of that you know maybe in some of the fire stations that i worked in there'd be you know a little memorial or something like that but it's it's different in the cities that face devastation and saw what the firefighters yeah. did you yeah know? yeah well so there so as we approach the 20th anniversary of september 11th um uh i'm i'm thinking especially about crises and what happens with people now the 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 there's that idea that when the going gets tough, the tough get going. Um, and I think of that as aspirational. It's what you'd hope people would do. It's along the same lines of crime doesn't pay. Crime does pay if you can get away with it. That's unfortunate. So we say something as if there's a natural law that says it doesn't pay. Well, we say that because it does pay and we're trying to prevent it. So we're trying to discourage it, but it's important to keep in mind that crime does does pay if you can get away with it apparently um uh so when the going gets tough there's a fundamental question in my work and it's and it's really uh it's come home to roost these days which is do crises make us wiser more likely to join together <coughs> uh, to band together and collaborate or does it make us do something else that's more dangerous now, a lot of the aftermath of 2020, a lot of the, we could say the, 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 what do you call them, tributes to the 2020 disaster these days are arguing that it actually made the United States a lot dumber, um, that it actually served its um, Islamic fundamentalist functions, just like a lot of what Russia is doing right now is uh, has has succeeded in serving their functions. So one way this is described is as sadofascism. So sadofascism is when you um, you don't think you can beat you you don't think you can overpower other nations, but there are two ways to be to overpower them. One is to improve your game, and the other is to make their game worse. So there's an argument that the terrorist attacks. Um, are actually undermining that that Putin actually wanted to undermine the United States, or and certainly ISIS did, or, or the, the prior to ISIS, Al Qaeda and uh, Osama bin Laden and all those people, and that we actually freaked out um, uh, right on schedule. That actually a whole lot of us. So this is setting aside the the or factoring in how much we came together. And then also paying attention to the way that we came apart. Um, I think of it that in crises, what often happens is that people reach up with one hand to grab any kind of vague rationalization for reaching down with the other hand to grab whatever the hell they want. That this is one of the ways that people respond to crises. They don't come together. They don't soften. They don't wake up. Um, I'm very suspect of wake, uh, woke movements. I think that the name woke is apt. Uh, I, we're not dealing with a more woke movement right now than MAGA. MAGA by far outpaces the wokeness. It, it's the whole idea that I once was lost and now I'm found and now I've got the answers and all that. You know, Protestantism, Christianity, all of those woke movements. But the, what's apt about the name is that when you're talking about woke, by the evening you're tired again. It's, you, you don't wake up once and for all. What's that about? <laughs> I mean, like, like I, I once slept and now I'm awake for the rest of my life. No, for all eternity. No, that's not how it works. So, so paying attention to how one way to think about it, and Giuliani is a great example of this, is that there are all these unsung heroes, people we take for granted, we assume are going to be there to help us. Um, there's actually a big chunk of my theory, which is about uh, of the theory we work on, which is about this. That is, anything you can turn into a habit, a reliable habit, like depending on the fire 
uh, fire force, firefighting force, um, you will. You don't want to think about that stuff. You think about other things. So um, uh, because it's covered. So all of these unsung heroes, all the first responders, um, in a way, they're crowded out by these people who undeservedly claim credit for it and grandstand as if they were the heroes of the moment. Kim Jong-un did this, Stalin did this. These guys, made, they made up whole stories about how they were on the front lines of the revolution. They were not, but they gained, they gained the power by which to basically recreate history. So they were the glorious founders of, this, of the movement. So they, they basically are stealing your thunder. And your thunder is is goes unsung, uh, and and it and it can go unsung because people take it for granted. There's never been a time when people thought they were more independent, and they've never been more independent than they are in modern civilization. And why is that? Because grocery stores are reliable, because the internet is reliable, because firefighters became reliable, because education became reliable. So reliable that they get neglected, and then we're going to see what happens when you neglect this stuff. You know, our infrastructure needs to be maintained, and that includes firefighters. So, yeah, it's so you get this whole movement that says, we built that, it's all, I'm only independent, libertarianism, this whole idea that I could do everything by myself. Yeah, if you, if you don't factor in everything that you reliably depend upon. <laughs> yeah, sure. <laughs> yeah, you want libertarianism? Go live in Somalia. They've got it, <laughs> right? That's what libertarianism <laughs> yields you. <laughs> no infrastructure. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, man, I... It's it's funny. I I have had this this very same conversation, discussion, I, a debate. What 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 have you? <laughs> right. But um, yeah, I um, man, I, I really appreciate you coming on it and talking with me today. This has been incredibly enlightening. Um, I I I'd like to know is your book out or Yes and no. So it's already out for free as a pod class. So the way I did my last edit on it was I read the whole thing and edited it in. So it's a very clean recording of the whole book. What's up with assholes? Uh, Advanced psychoproctology for beginners. Totally accessible. It's been read by lots of people. Uh, blue collar workers with no background in psychology dug it. They got it. They and that's my goal. So I'm dealing with fairly elaborate ideas, but I'm trying to make them accessible, familiar, trying to ground them in reality. So it's a podcast anybody can get for free. It's just 14 sessions, um, half hour a piece. That's out already. And if anybody wants to contact me, um, I'd be happy to send them a PDF of it. In my, in my situation, I neither need status or money from my work. This is the, the, the gift of my opportunity. And it's actually what my dad said was the right thing to do with an inheritance. He says, most of the, the best work doesn't pay well. So the most important work doesn't pay well. So go do some of that is basically what he said when he gave me the money. But I realized only a few years ago, I don't need this, I don't need status. And I don't wanna, I don't wanna keep on, I don't wanna have to pander to get status. I wanna try and make the likely story as likable and accessible and intuitive as possible. So I don't need to be a big bestseller. And I, I mean, I'd like, I'd like more audience. Um, so please go look up my stuff. Uh, you can find way too much of me on the internet just by looking up my name. But I also have a new website that I've been building called jeremysherman.com that has all my stuff. And I've got memes. I make, a, I make 10 memes a day from this work. I, you know, um, you can friend me on Facebook. I'm, I'm very, uh, very welcoming. But my book is out in that, if you just look up what's up with assholes or what's up with a-holes or my name, you'll find it as a podcast and just download the thing. And listening, I don't, I don't read books anymore sitting down. I can't do that. I'm too restless a person. I speed listen to a book a week easily. Um, and so podcast is a great way to, to download information. You can, you know, you can do, uh, errands, you can do, um, you can do exercise, you can clean up the house, whatever, um, while you're doing it, you can't do that while you're reading books. And, and the book applies to everything from assholes to, uh, national and international cults. So everything from an ex who drove you crazy. Uh, or a boss who drives you crazy, or a relative who drives you crazy, out to, I mean, I, I, 
in the book, I define cult as the plural of asshole. As you've got gaggles of geese and you've got cults of assholes. It's just a plural term for it. Um, and, and I do a lot of work in, with the Inst International uh, Society for Cultic Studies. So I study all that. But if you're interested in the overall problem, the, the, the people, the know-it-alls, the guys who play God, the people who play God, male or female, it's not about that. It's not about the style. You can, like I said, you can be a really polite one. You can be a Buddhist asshole. You can be a leftist asshole. You can be an atheist asshole. Not about what you believe. If you're interested in those people, and I bet you are, most people, if you're watching TV or reading fiction, you are a budding psychoproctologist. You're fascinated by assholes. You probably just haven't gotten into the advanced work. If you watch Will Ferrell movies, you're just fascinated by assholes because he plays one so exquisitely. I love that man. <laughs> um, if you like Eric Cartman, I mean, if you watch South Park and you, you think Eric Cartman is interesting, you are interested in assholes. You might as well admit it, face it, and get into the question. What is a butthead? Since it can't just be whoever you happen to butt heads with. Well, yeah, what is what makes someone a butthead? <laughs> oh man, this was great. All right, um, I will have your your website in the in the show notes. Um, and and you said that the the podcast everything is it's is, all available for free online. You just go on to you know iTunes has it, uh, uh, Spotify has it. It's everywhere. The, the, you know, the information is accessible from so many sources. That's the good news for us uh, creative content producers. The bad news is that everybody gets to do that. So it's quite the flood out there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much, Jeremy. I really appreciate it. This has been great. A, a, a pleasure to be on your show. And thank you for your years of service. Good Lord, what you guys do, man out there in the field. Uh, I'm impressed. Thank you for your service. And thank you for having me on your show. Thank you for listening to this episode of From Embers to Excellence. Please like and subscribe to my YouTube channel. Follow me on your favorite podcast platform and visit hollenbachleadership.com for additional content. My goal is and always will be to add value to as many people as possible. So if I can be of any assistance to you or someone you know, Please connect with me via email or on one of my social media accounts linked on the homepage of my website. Remember, our failures don't define us unless we let them, and the only true measure of a leader is the success of their team.